Thank you for your very kind uh, introduction. Can you hear me right at the back? Yeah. I'll, I'll try and keep to this volume. On Saturday, the 12th of August, 1880, a horseman rode into Oxford from London, turned into Corn Market Street, and dismounted at the Bull Inn. He was a man of 65, and you would have guessed him to be a gentleman from his clothes, though one of modest means or tastes, because he travelled without a servant. No portrait of him survives, except for a fanciful one in a window of Bristol Cathedral. And we have only the assertion of a hostile witness that he was swarthy, one-eyed, and born in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> he knew Oxford well, having studied there, and like other old students who come back years later, he spent some time exploring the streets to see what had changed since his youth. But then he did something very unusual for an alumnus or a tourist. He walked alongside buildings, placing one foot carefully in front of the other. He was measuring their dimensions. The Divinity School, two churches, three colleges, two monasteries, two friaries, and a bridge. He took out a pen and inkhorn from his belt and paper from his pocket. He wrote down the measurements in what he called paces, and we still possess them. William Worcester is one of the most original and likeable figures of the 15th century. He was born six centuries ago exactly, we don't know his birthday, in the era of Agincourt, not in Ireland, but in St James's back, Bristol, the son of a Bristol citizen. He went to a grammar school in Bristol and at about the age of 17 to Oxford, where he was living by 1432 in Hart Hall, the hall that later became Hartford College. He was at Oxford for about six years, so that he may well have taken a degree before being given a job by Sir John Fastall, a wealthy Norfolk knight who had done well out of the Hundred Years' War. Worcester acted as Fastall's secretary in man of business. He married a young widow with a child, and they had more children. Fastall was rather stingy and remarked that Worcester should have been a priest so that he could be paid for the church benefits. <laughs> However, Fastall promised that when he died, he would leave Worcester a small estate to support him. That debt took place in 1459, but trouble ensued. Fastolf was childless, and his great wealth attracted the greed of others. He wished it to endow a collegiate church, but one of his executors, John Paston, forged a will that left the estate to him. <laughs> the Duke of Norfolk had designs on the estate as well, and seized Keister Castle from Paston. Worcester was another executor, and during the following years he exerted himself to get Fastolf's wishes fulfilled. Eventually, after great travails, hurts, and even imprisonment, he saw the Fastolf affair resolved by most of the estate reverting to William Wainfleet, Bishop of Winchester, to help finance Wainfleet's Morphine College, Oxford. He himself received a small estate at Pockthorpe, outside Norwich. The late 1470s, therefore, saw Worcester settled financially in a modest way and, in our terms, retired unable to spend his time as he wished. His wish was to travel, see places, and meet people. Mrs. Worcester stayed behind in Norwich. In 1478, he rode, usually alone, from Norwich through London down to Southampton, up to Bristol, across the River Severn to Tintern Abbey and back to Bristol, then down through Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall to St. Michael's Mount, back to Bristol again, and then his home. In 1479, he travelled only to London and to several places in Norfolk and Suffolk. But in 1480, he set out on another long journey, London, Oxford, Bristol, down to Glastonbury and back to Bristol. He stayed overnight on his travels at inns, in private houses, or in monastic guest houses, the latter not always attractive. Linen pollutable, <coughs> pottage unsuitable, liquor undrinkable, blankets unthinkable. <laughs> <laughs> of the poor food 
uh, and beds at St Bennet's Hugh in Norfolk. And he made notes of his three journeys on paper sheets. His roots may suggest that he was only interested in the south of England, but this is not true. As we shall see, he was avid for information about all parts of the British Isles, and he went to the north at least once in 1457, when he got as far as York. Even in the south, he collected information about Chester, the road there too, and the course of the River Dean. The last of William's surviving notes was made at Bristol in late September 1480. That is also the last that we hear of him alive. By 1485, he was dead. I suspect myself that he died suddenly in the autumn of 1480 of a stroke or a heart attack, very likely at Bristol. We have no later notes, and William was an obsessive note-taker. He might, of course, have made more notes that have been lost, but one would expect him to have made the odd later jotting in those that survived, and there seems to be none. Where he was buried or commemorated, I have not been able to discover. Fortunately, his notes survived him. They passed from his family into the hands of a cleric of Norwich Cathedral, then to a fellow of Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and finally into that college library. But they were very little known until they were printed in the late 18th century, and Worcester still receives less than his due in English historiography. Even today, in the latest TV programme, for example, the discovery of England is primarily associated with the geographers and antiquaries of Tudor time. Let us now explore William's interests and the information he gathered. A large part of his notes is concerned with geography, and this can be divided into the wider geography of Europe and the narrower geography of the British Isles. His broader horizons were those of someone who lived near the great eastern ports of Kings Lynn and Great Yarmouth, and came from the great western port of Bristol, with a brother-in-law who owned a Bristol ship. In other words, he was highly aware of sea routes. Northwards, he gathered information about Scotland, the Hebrides, and the Orkneys. He mentions Iceland, which he claims to have been discovered for English fishermen by Robert Hapen of Cromer soon after 1400, and where William Cannings of Bristol had lost one of his ships. Eastwards, he made notes about Scandinavian lands and the eastern shores of the Baltic. Uh, as far as Vilnius and Novgorod. Southwards, he heard about or cared about less. France occurs in relation to the Hundred Years' War, in which Fastolf had served, but Italy and Spain are hardly mentioned. But he did know that Robert Sterling, of Bristol shipowner, had sailed to the Holy Land with pilgrims and had been wrecked on the coast of Greece while coming back. And he saw a book that listed the Greek islands, and he copied down some information about the Holy Land from a board in a Bristol church. Westwards, he knew something about the Isle of Man, and more about Ireland, its highest point, its rivers, and its harbours. And at this time, the dawn of the Age of Discovery, he was aware of the Portuguese explorations in West Africa. He mentions Madeira, the Azores, Guinea, and made lists of the Bissau and Cape Verde Islands. And he was aware of stirrings of interest in crossing the Atlantic. He says that if you wish to sail to Brazil, which in 1480 meant a legendary island west of Europe, you must set your course from the Great Blasket Island off the southwest coast of Ireland. And he reports that on the 15th of July, 1480, a ship belonging to his brother-in-law, John Jay, set out from Bristol to find Brazil, skippered by one Lloyd, whom William calls the most knowledgeable mariner in England. The ship was apparently out for nine weeks, but did not find the island, and was blown back to Ireland by the autumn gales. But only 17 years later, John Cabot would sail successfully from Bristol to Newfoundland. Near a home, he gathered material about the geography of the British Isles. He was not very interested in landscape or in economic matters, 
but he mentions the Welsh mountains and the peak of Carol in Derbyshire with its entrance into hell, and he made a personal visit to Wookie Hall Cavern near Wells. This was already a tourist attraction, where guides carried flaming torches of reeds and took you past a rock called the Porter through caves known as the Kitchen or the Parlour, where you could view what William calls hanging stones. He is more forthcoming about rivers, no doubt because they were so crucial for travellers, and mentions several of the major ones and a good many minor ones. Indeed, on his visit to Devon and Cornwall, he managed to list virtually all the important rivers of the two counties. Islands attracted him, too, perhaps because of their importance to ships as landmarks or hazards. He mentions a very great number, even islets and rocks around Cornwall, the Scillies, Wales, Ireland, the Hebrides, the Orkneys, and the east and south coasts of England. In some cases, he gives their measurements and states whether they were inhabited or contained buildings. <coughs> he is informative about road travel. It was necessary to know, as now when planning a journey, how far you had to go and what were the stages into which the journey fell, punctuated in his case by meals, feeding a horse and staying overnight. This information was in the heads of people who travelled regularly or catered for travellers, and by the early 14th century it helped produce the Goth map, now in the Bodleian Library, based partly on roads and mileages. William got hold of an itinerary to St Michael's Mount with distances and stopping places, which had been made by Thomas Cardinal Ware, and he kept a similar record of his own journey there. He also noted down all the accounts of some routes that he didn't travel, like the road from Bristol to Chester. Such information was valuable for future use or for passing on to others. Bridges were an important adjunct in this respect because one needed to know where to cross rivers or to take an alternative route because of floods or thieves. And William was assiduous in recording bridges, including every one across the Cornish Taylor. Churches account for another large part of his notes. He did not usually stop to look at them while he was riding, so those that he visited were chiefly in the places where he stayed the night, especially cathedrals, monasteries and friaries, but also parish churches in major towns. In many cases he measured their external or internal dimensions, sometimes by using a measuring stick, but more often by recording his paces, in other words, the careful placing of his shoes. William's uh, shoe length varies, but is reckoned on average to be 21 inches. He gave little attention to the appearance of buildings, although he was sometimes struck by them. He says that the aisle windows of extra cathedral contain five beautiful lights, and that the whole church is vaulted over in the most lovely way. This lack may reflect lack of time, because he appreciated fine architectural detail, notably when he carefully sketched the profile of the columns around the west door of St Stephen's Church, Bristol, and he also recorded the motifs in words of a similar doorway to Mary Redcliffe. He often noted tombs in churches and copied inscriptions from display walls. He is in fact a witness to how much written material was displayed in churches by the late 15th century. When possible, he sought access to a church's calendar on martyrology, from which he could copy feast days of unusual saints and dates of commemorations of dead words. This, success, this access depended on finding a sympathetic member of the church body. Sometimes he was successful and sometimes not. Castles were another topic of interest. On three occasions he made systematic lists of them, 34 in Cornwall, 9 in Wiltshire and 18 in Herefordshire. The castles included what we would call hill forts and he sometimes noted the owners and conditions. This interest extended to other 
dwellings of the nobility and gentry. The receiver general of the Earl of Warwick told him how Earl Richard Beecham had built the south side of Warwick Castle, the castles of Baggington and Hanley, the manor houses of Caversham and Sutton Coldfield, and the hunting lodges of Barkswell and Claverdon. He learned how Ralph Lord Cromwell spent more than 4,000 marks building Tattershall Castle and other places, and how Lord Scales pulled down a beautiful manor house at Ray near Castle Rising to stop it falling into the hands of a rival claimant. The staffing of these buildings absorbed him as well, and the squire of Thomas Beaufort, Duke of Exeter, told him the Duke had 140 horsemen in his retinue, including numerous knights and squires. That he paid his grooms four marks a year in wages, that he fed 13 poor people every day, and entertained travellers and old soldiers with food and money. The most elaborate inventory of buildings is to be found in a section of his manuscript on Bristol. This is not a finished piece of work, and William may not have decided on its final form. It begins with a list of streets and lanes, some of them with measured distances. Subsequently, there are descriptions of religious houses and churches, often with measurements too, and of the city gates, wall towers, and the cellars where merchants kept their goods. One merchant house is described, that of William Cannings, the most famous merchant, with a tower and a row of four bay windows, highly decorated like the rooms inside. There are also some details of local life. The main Bristol River, the Avon, was tidal, with a rise of seven or eight fathoms at the spring tides. When the tide was out and the river Avon flowed freshly, women washed woolen clothes in the river. Sometimes I've seen 12 women at a time washing. Ships moored on the river from Wales, Cornwall, Devon and Somerset, bringing tin and fish, and a crane was provided to help load and unload them. The Bristol merchants themselves owned ships. Ten belonged to cannings, and their names and tonnages are given. We hear of a grammar school over the New Gate, probably the school to which Worcester went, the regulated prostitutes in the suburbs of Barrow Street and Old King Street, and the gallows high up on St Michael's Hill. The last topic for which I have time is that of saints, which appears throughout William's notes. He was not the first person to collect saints. A late Anglo-Saxon text called The Resting Places of Saints had listed some of the major saints and their burial places, and the 14th century writer John of Tyman had brought together the Latin lives of the major figures in England. William was aware that there were many saints in the British Isles with localised cults, and he gathered information about these from both written and oral sources. So, the Scot who informed him about Hebrides told him about St. Duffac of Ross, St. David Bruce, and St. Magnus of Orkney. <coughs> the, bis the bishop of found out gave him a list of 18 saints in South Wales, and other sources produced St. Morhold and St. Teradorf from the Isle of Man. And one suspects that one motive for William Worcester's visit to Cornwall in 1478 was to discover the little-known saints of that county. This he did assiduously, recording them from church calendars of oral testimony. Where possible, he noted their burial places and feast days. And we know a good deal of our knowledge of Corn we owe a good deal of our knowledge of Cornish saints to him because he was the only traveller in the county to notice them before their cults began to be dismantled. How did William acquire all this information? He had three kinds of sources. One came from his own initiative, his travels, notes of distances between staging posts, the measurement of churches, castles, houses and bridges. 
Next, there were books like the calendars and martyrologies of religious houses and parish churches, which he tried to access when he could. As well as recording saints, these volumes listed the dates of death of benefactors, members of the nobility, gentry, merchant class and clergy, in whom William was interested. He seized on chronicles when he could get hold of them. Several are mentioned in his notes, including Nennius, Geoffrey of Monmouth, and Gerald of Wales. His historical interests were wide. They included Geoffrey's invented history, British history through Roman and Anglo-Saxon times down to recent events, and European history drawn from the chronicle of Marianus Scotus. He refers to the works of Aristotle, to Christian and other grammarians, the rules of Benedict, the life of St. Anselm, the writings of Robert Grosstes, which he lists, and the Miroir des Dames of Durand. He was, in fact, widely read, and he was himself an author, an aspect of his life to which, unfortunately, I cannot do justice today. He composed the Book of Noblesse, to encourage the nobility and gentry to revive their martial arts and virtues after their defeat in the wars of France. He translated Cicero's treatise of old age from the French and wrote some other lost works, a biography of Sir John Fastolf, an account of the ancient families of Norfolk, and some kind of study of the antiquities of England. Worcester also learned a great deal by word of mouth. He would talk to anyone, and his notes are careful to record his informants. John Smith, Bishop of Clandaff, told him about Welsh saints. Sir Roger Kinaston, a Shropshire knight of Apsema, and the rivers of Wales. A former servant of the Duke of Exeter, about Welsh rivers. Uh, Herefordshire Castles and the Battle of Mortimer's Cross, including the names of the gentry who had fought and died in the battle. A Scot told him about Scotland and an Orkney man in London about Orkney. A hermit of Elsing in Norfolk, who had lived with Henry IV's daughter Philip, a Queen of Denmark, reminisced about Scandinavia. But William was quite happy in talking to ordinary people. At the next cathedral, he struck up a friendship with John Skinner, who he describes as a sub-sex, a sexton, a, a, a very lowly character, but someone who could tell him about the place. A young blacksmith told him the height of Clifton Gorge, and a ferryman who took him across the water in the gorge turned out to be a mine of information about sea distances from Bristol to places down the Bristol Channel as far as the Sims. And all this, William noted down. There is a slightly obsessive tinge to these inquiries and journeys. If we examine William's visit to St. Michael's Mount in 1478, we find that he was in Cornwall for eight days, from midday Sunday to the afternoon of Monday week. He travelled for about 155 miles for the single rest day, so his average was well over 20 miles a day. When he reached the mount, he spent only the morning there. Well, one doesn't need to spend longer, but you might have thought that somebody coming all the way from uh, Norwich might have uh, lingered a little bit longer for repose or reflection. He then called on a cousin near Foy, but he stayed only one night, after which he did his longest ride of some 30 miles uh, to get to Tavistock. And yet there was no need for haste as far as one could see. He was just hyperactive. And it must have been quite a strain to be in a room with William. <laughs> his Cornish notes include a number of lists the 34 local castles. The road distances in Cornwall, including roads that William did not cover. The counties, rivers and bridges. These facts cannot have just slipped out in conversation. 
like some of the anecdotes that he was that he records. They were the result of grilling people. Go on, what more castles? <coughs> the bridge called. How far away is that? And you visualise two men with a flask of wine or a jug of ale between them, one racking his brains and the other scratching away with his quill. <laughs> so what was supposed to try and achieve? In 1478, he was 63, a respectable age, and if I am correct, he was to die two years later. He can hardly have aimed to write a description of England or Britain, since his recorded journeys are largely restricted to East Anglia, London, Bristol, and the Southwest. Of course, there may be other notes that have not survived. He had interests that he wanted to pursue. There is so much about geography, especially islands and rivers, routes and distances, and about buildings, people, and saints, that he clearly liked collecting evidence about them, as one might collect stamps or coins. These were largely private interests, although land and sea routes and distances had a practical value, which he could use himself or pass on to other people. Sometimes he may have sought out informants, like the hermit who told him about the Queen of Denmark and about Scandinavia. But at other times, his knowledge was learned by chance from people he met on his journeys. It can't have been anticipated, it can't have been collected to build into some larger structure. He may have aimed at map making, his information about the southwest, although gathered casually over a mere fortnight, would have enabled him to draw a reasonably well-sized and scaled outline of the peninsula and its principal rivers, although he could not have done justice to the capes and inlets. Most certainly, there is the description of Bristol. This is the most methodical and most complete of his researches. If he had been given a couple more years of life, he could have finished the research and produced a detailed city map, a descriptive inventory, or a literary account. It is hard to know how he would have presented his material, because models for doing so would have been hard to find. Was he a historian in our sense? Did he judge and criticise his sources? It is difficult to be sure about this because he was making notes rather than writing a finished and critical account. He certainly noted allegedly supernatural happenings. Thus, when the Bishop of Bath and Wells forbade the people of Wells to fish in the nearby river, the fish disappeared until he relaxed his prohibition. <laughs> Maysbury Castle near Wells was built by a giant named Mark. If a bird flew across one island of the Irish coast, it would die. On another, Skellig Michael, the inhabitants could not die, and they had to be taken to the mainland when they wished to do so. <laughs> but William does not comment on these things. He only records them, and we do not know how seriously he took them. He is a punctilious recorder of his sources, the books and people from uh, whom or which he gained information. He obviously wished to achieve accuracy in his measurements of buildings, and he placed this above describing them. At least once he discussed history with John Moore Lynch, a monk of Glastonbury, who pointed out disparities in the accounts of King Arthur. Most of the information he acquired was factual rather than speculative and conjectural. My last duty is to place him in context. How unusual was he, and where does he belong? He could have had numerous antiquarian contemporaries, because although he himself is well recorded in other sources, such as the Paston Letters, we would not be aware of his antiquarian tastes without the against the odds survival of his notes. 
We certainly know of two men with similar interests. One was William Way, born in about 1406, died 1476, fellow of Exeter College and subsequently of Eton College. Way had made three long pilgrimages to Compostela in 1456, Jerusalem in 1458, and Jerusalem again in 1462. He was a pioneer archaeologist who made a map of the Holy Land and plans or paintings and wooden models of sites in the Holy Land, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, and the Church of the Nativity of Bethlehem. He bequeathed them all to Eddington Priory in Wiltshire, where he ended his life and intended to build a replica of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The other antiquarian was John Rouse, who was born in about 1420 and died in 1492. He became chantry priest of Guy's Cliff near Warwick, a theme park built by the Earls of Warwick to celebrate their legendary ancestor, Guy of Warwick. Rouse wrote historical works celebrating the Earls and the town of Warwick, but he had wider interests. He sketched historical figures and was aware of the evolution of chainmail into plate armour. He wrote a history of the Kings of England, into which he inserted a pioneering list of deserted villages in the Midlands as part of a discussion of depopulation. He collected saints, wrote a history of the two English universities to prove the seniority of Oxford, and compiled a list of Oxford's academic halls. The interests of these three men overlapped, Way and Worcester on buildings, Worcester and Rouse on Oxford and local history, but there is no evidence that they met or knew of one another. Indeed, um, William Worcester had the opportunity of visiting uh, Eddington and Warwick, I think, and there is no uh, sign that he wanted to do so. The late Bruce McFarlane, who published what is still the best general essay about Worcester in 1957, regarded him and Rouse as pioneers. He continued, should it be that they were products of the same school or tradition, we have lost track of their masters. We are forced at present to regard them as independent explorers of this new world of scholarship. With some reluctance in differing from my old tutor and supervisor, to whom I owe so much, I beg to disagree. Classical writers commonly described the geography of the region as well as recounting its history. The earliest British writer, Gildas, refers to the two Roman walls and the forts of the Saxon's shore. Bede's first chapter of his ecclesiastical history begins with the measurements of Britain and describes the natural resources and languages of the island. Later writers discuss the natural wonders of Britain, such as Nennius, Henry of Huntingdon, and Alfred of Beverley. And this approach is followed in the popular world history, the polychronicon of Ranulf Higdon in the early 14th century. Gerald of Wales wrote descriptions of Wales and Ireland in the late 12th century. William saw uh, a copy of the description of the itinerary in Wales. Matthew Paris drew maps of Britain in the 13th century, and I've already mentioned the 14th century golf map. So interests in English geography, history, communications, churches, castles, and saints are much older than these three 15th century antiquaries. The accurate portrayal of buildings was also developed in manuscript illuminations and later on in paintings, notably in the depiction of, of the castles of the Duke de Berry by the Limbrick brothers. The reputations of the 15th century antiquaries benefit from the fact that the later one goes in history, the more has survived. If we could see more clearly into the work of 12th and 13th century historians, 
we would probably find more than that, that, that was analogous. Gerald of Wales may well have uh, made collections of notes um, which we don't possess. The fact that we possess Worcester's notes, however, is linked with the growth of a new kind of recording material, paper. This offered a cheap and easy way to make records. And by the 15th century, many men and schoolboys were carrying pen cases and ink horns on their belts. So William could note down information while he was reading or hearing or seeing it, which would have been less easy for Gerald of Wales or Henry of Huntingdon. He was fortunate too that his notes survived in good hands. But if I am inclined not to see Worcester, Rouse and Way as absolute pioneers, they must also be given their due. They are not known in the figures as much as representative ones. Their historical interests were shared, if not quite so intensively, by many of their contemporaries. One finds an interest in local history in municipal records, for example, and, of course, in the mouths of those who gave William information. William could talk to other people who were interested in history. Um, William's interest in Wales uh, came about because he met Owen Lloyd, canon of Extra Cathedral, who owned a copy of Gerald of Wales and let William see it. There was already in the 15th century a popular recreational curiosity about England's landscape, history, and monuments, notably at Glastonbury, the Peak Cavern, Wookie Hole, Guy's Pit near Warwick, and the Tower. London. Probably other places could be added. This widespread and lively interest in topography and antiquities anticipated those of the better known eras of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and their writers such as Leyden Saxton, Sterling Campbell. <coughs> Worcester's project of surveying Bristol forestalled Stowe's survey of London by a hundred years. The Renaissance may have given a boost to antiquities by a fuller knowledge of what Greeks and Romans had done in that direction, but the Tudor writers did not begin the discovery of England. It started long before them and long before William, but he deserves to be remembered as the first person to leave us a record of an antiquarian's day-to-day -day researches. And these were not merely a private hobby. He had a wish to preserve what he learnt for those who would come after him. When he visited Glasney College at Penryn in Cornwall in September 1478, he wrote down a Latin couplet from a display board in the church, which evidently struck a chord with him. It runs in translation. It pleases me to say, or to place in writing for the bystander, the things that I have learnt for people in the future. These words are a fitting epitaph for one who has left us so much that would otherwise have vanished. We owe him a lot, and it is right to acknowledge the fact in this, the 600th year since his birth. <laughs>